Okay, it's time to go with the plays. Wow. Lots of people are interested in this discussion tonight because we're talking about faith. Uh, we're talking about should we ever have faith? And I think it's going to be a meaningful conversation. And one of the things that we do best, I think, um, out of everywhere, is that we maintain a, uh, an extremely respectful conversation. And hopefully tonight our conversation will be substantive. And so I'd like to welcome you to the place where people are honored, yes, honored, and where people are respected highly so. And so thanks for joining us tonight. And we do have Arn Ra in the house, not actually here at the studio, but uh, we have him coming our way via Google. Um, the same thing is true with Michael Harden. Yes, he's a theologian. Aaron Ra is this atheist. And so if they start talking back and forth, pay attention. They may say something that uh, where they find agreement, uh, or they may say something that creates a little bit of tension. And so we're hoping that this conversation will be not just useful, but telling, etc. cetera. Uh, Stephen Hoyt also is in the house that is... He's on this show. I think he has a lot to say concerning this particular topic. The topic is um, Arn Ra is an epistemist. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, this term came or was originated by Bonnick Dance. Um, and I think that she is the one who coined the term. However, I stand to be corrected. Um, we do have apistis, which is quite a bit different than apistivist. But um, my point is we have people who are putting something on the table, and we're very, very thankful for that. And so I, I just read uh, a comment that is in the section. It says, <laughs> tension is fun. <laughs> that, that, is, that is good. I, I so agree with that. But with that said, I'd like to bring in my host first. Um, what say you, Bob? Well, hey. Hey, Gibby. And... Uh to be honest with you, I don't think it's so much the substance of what we're going to be talking about tonight that's creating the crowd. It's the fact that we have both Arn Ra and Michael Harden. Both of these are people who have had a huge impact on a great number of people. And when they talk, there's a lot of people who listen because they uh, they have resonated greatly with, with both of these people. And so when we bring them on here... Um, my goodness, uh, the number of people who like to kind of tune in to catch what they're saying is, is is awesome. So, and we've had we've had Aaron here a number of times, we have Michael here a number of times. We've even had them here talking to each other, <laughs> and and so there's some of our favorite guests, and uh, so we're happy to to have them with us and uh, see what they're going to do. And you caught me with my mouth full. I was eating pretzels. It was bad, bad time. <laughs> I know. You thought that I was going to be long-winded, did you not? Well, I was kind of hoping for it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Daryl, what say you? Are you looking forward to this conversation? Absolutely. We got a top-notch lineup tonight, and uh, I want to be the main spectator. I'm just looking forward to what everybody has to say. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> good. good. Sounds good. Uh, Aaron Ra, welcome to the program. I suppose that would work better if I unmuted my mic. Uh, Sometimes. Thank you once again. <laughs> hey, it was it was it was wonderful to have you here in Pensacola. I mean, most people don't know that you're a compassionist. You really love people. You love animals. Uh, you took one of our little kittens home with you, and you and your wife are amazing people need to know that about you you get out there and as you stated on a show many many uh shows ago sometimes you do this little bit of elbowing uh left and right simply to make room for other people to speak and i can appreciate that um this this is this is good and so thanks for coming to pensacola uh, we're looking forward to a good conversation tonight just like we've had in the past well thank you very much sir i enjoyed it um, we also have Michael Harden. He's a theologian. He's not an atheist, quote unquote. He's one who's thinking outside of the box. And so uh, you've got the peace sign next to your books and all of that. I mean, what's what's up with that, Michael? 
just, I suppose the this is my office. It's my man cave. I suppose kind of a throwback to my teenage years. I just, I love black lights. I love colors. And this is just how my office is. That, that's wonderful. It's fun. Okay, something is touching your yeah. microphone or something like that. Uh, we, we don't mind waiting until you no. fix that. Okay. I'm, my tablet's right. That's what I here is a tablet. Okay, your own tablet. Okay, sounds good. We'll make it do, make it work. Uh, we also have Stephen, Stephen Hoyt uh, in the conversation tonight. Um, he's been on the show a couple of times here recently, and he's done nothing but good. I mean, you're turning water into wine, Stephen. What say you? Hi. <laughs> it's good to meet everybody and uh, take part in uh, what I hope is going to be a productive discussion. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to do just a little bit of talking at the beginning. Uh, this may be just a waste of time, but I, I thought that it might be a bit meaningful. Arn Ra states, faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction which is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. Han Ra goes on to state, I am an epistivist because faith is the most dishonest position that is possible to have. Consequently, any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. Um, that's interesting. I don't agree with it. Um, I, I, I I see where you're coming from, and we're going to see what's out there. And so I, I want everyone else to say X, Y, and Z before I jump in, because I've got a lot, I think, that could add to the conversation, namely in the context in which theologians speak. And so uh, what say you, uh, Aaron Ra, concerning uh, the statements that you've made many, many times? Well, I don't make them lightly. And, and I don't make them without doing some research beforehand. And I will tell people that I mean, I, I obviously I have a lot of conversations with believers of different religions who all want to defend faith and they want to defend faith as a virtue. And one of the first things that is typically done is to redefine faith. I redefine it so that if, I've had people tell me that faith is a belief that is based on reason which is actually the opposite definition, not just from the dictionary, but from, from the consensus of all available sources. I mean, if, if, as I've said many times, I mean, you, you get a collection of dictionaries and, and, and look up the word in a multiple, uh, multiple set, and, and you'll see that you, there's a consistency there. They're usually in the dictionary, they'll give you two contexts. One is that faith is a, you know, a sort of a trust in the colloquial context, and then there's the context that's particular to religion. Within the context of religion, faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. It's a, it's a sometimes called a stoic conviction. Matter of fact, uh, let me see, uh, dictionary.com, I've got one up here. Confident belief in the truth, value, or trustworthiness of a person, idea, or a thing that does not rely on logical proof or material evidence. Uh, then some other dictionaries will talk about how um, I mean, a lot of believers will say that faith is merely trust, but it's not just trust. It's trust with a prefix and a suffix. It's a complete trust, and the suffix, of course, the important one, is not based on evidence. And that's, that is the core of what that, uh, that means. If you read um, any number of uh, theologians, past and present, you'll get some admission in there that you're going to believe what you what you're supposed to believe regardless whether there's anything to indicate that and you must defend these beliefs for reasons that do not qualify as any sort of what i would recognize as factual evidence and some people will say that you know well i have evidence when that if the evidence of my belief is that uh, i used to do a lot of drugs and i don't now so i've got changed lives as if that's evidence that's highly subjective and it's not factual and there are some people that say that if it's not factual then it's not evidence but people will say well that's my reason and so you can't say that i believe without a reason but even those who say who insist with me that they have evidence for their position or that their faith is based on evidence when i pry into okay what was the evidence that drew to you drew you to your conclusion which you eventually get up against that wall as far at some point you'll get an admission that they're going to fall back on faith, which means they go back to the definition that I originally asserted it was in the beginning. Or if they tell me that I've defined faith incorrectly and that faith is actually a belief that is based on reason or that is simply trust and it doesn't matter what the context is, then 
not only will either get to a point where they can't give me anything that would qualify evidence that got them to this position, or they'll make an alternate uh, assertion wherein <coughs> they tell me that, uh, that there, there's not enough evidence, they don't think that there's enough evidence to believe in evolution, or they, they say, uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So it, both of these are an implicit admission that I got the definition correct the first time, and they knew it, but they can't argue this position. And then the more important thing, of course, is that every, uh, all the creationist organizations, at least all the, the leading ones, uh, offer a statement of faith on their own website. They post this proudly, you know, wherein they phrase in different ways that they're going to believe what the Bible says for reasons, again, that don't have, that, that are not related to evidence and that they simply cannot even consider any evidence that they might be wrong. As, as William Lane Craig said, you know, whenever, you know, science or whenever evidence stands against your faith, the faith must win. And how did he put it? You know, whenever, whenever you know, science has a conflict with the Bible, then science is wrong. And there's many theologians that have said exactly that. Now, for me, it's a personal uh, thing. I remember, remember that, that my movement to this when I was a little boy. I remember reading a lot of things. I was into cryptozoology. I was into all kinds of preposterous things that were being, you know, all the woo that was being promoted in the Los Angeles of the 1970s where I grew up. And I remember realizing that there's only certain books that would talk about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and Noah's Ark and extraterrestrial aliens making the, li the Nazca lines in South America and all that Zachariah Sitchin stuff. So if you look at a science book, you don't see any support for these sorts of things whatsoever, ever at all. So I thought, well, why is that? And I thought maybe I should just read the books that I know will reaffirm what I already want to believe. And as soon as I said that to myself, I instantly realized how intellectually dishonest that is. And that it didn't matter what I wanted to believe. The only, the only value any information has is, is how accurate you can show it to be. And if you can't show that it is accurate at all, then that information has no value at all. So it doesn't matter what you believe. All that matters is why you can believe it. Can, why you believe it. can you show justification for that belief? And if you can't, then it's not even worth talking about. Okay. Okay. Uh from a theological standpoint, uh, Michael, you are this theologian, and I will say, and put this on the table tonight, you deal with theology in a, in a theoretical sense. Uh, you're not all about certainty at all, and so in a sure. sense, it's, it's about theoretical theology. And so what can you say that is to Aaron Ra, that is to either push back or agree or whatever? I mean, where are you in the landscape of this? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, there's a couple of things. The first is that in a previous episode, we did, the very first one we did, um, where Aaron and I were together, um, he laid out all his reasons why he could not believe God, and I agreed with every last one of them. Because the fact is, the God that he's reacting against is the god of a, a small portion of Christendom, a small portion of Islam, a small portion of other faith traditions, and that's essentially the sacrificial and the violent god. And I understand that reaction. I, to do. I, understand, uh, I, I despise people like Kent Ham and these kinds of folks that um, do pseudoscience. I have no doubt that uh, God knows that fundamentalist and evangelical Christianity with its endless apologetics and silliness has um, has made a mockery, in a sense, of the rest of the prison. But I will say this, when when, when Aaron says most theologians... Okay, uh, Michael, <laughs> Mike, Michael, hold yeah. on for a minute. Uh, your audio is breaking up so much, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going and to hand the ball to Bob. This. Let me try this. Give me one second. Okay. I don't know if I can do this. I'm going to try and get this on my main computer. I was going to say that you could just leave your feed up, and uh, maybe we could uh, bring you in via phone or something like that, because we want to hear uh, your argument here. Yeah. Sometimes if you reconnect, it just might give us a better connection, you know. But... Well, 
while he's doing that, yeah. Um, um, maybe we could get a comment from Stephen on this matter while uh, while Michael is uh, trying to reconnect and something's stretching our pictures. <laughs> uh, Stephen, what, what what say you? Yeah, I don't I don't think I have any problems with what he's talking about when he's talking about theology. And uh, my concerns are more about epistemology and um, you know what we want to make of faith. What I'm trying to discern, and you can help me, Aaron, is uh, that when you, your language, when you're describing faith, is is seems to be an ethical comment on it being unreasonable and dishonest. And when I look at what it is we're trying to do, talking about truth, we're trying to justify something. And these seem to be uh, saying nothing about justification, but more about ethics. Um, and so I would think that faith matters to you being unreasonable and dishonest because of what Christians tend to do with what they claim to know, and they really can't claim to know it. Is that about right? Yeah, Peter, uh, Peter Bogosian did a, a presentation saying that faith was pretending to know what you don't know. And I don't. I just barely got the edge on him when I'd, I'd already done a video where and I said that that faith was pretending to know what you know you really don't know, and that no one even can know, and that you really just believe for no good reason at all. That was the way I phrased it. But I mean, that's always been my biggest complaint. You know, people that say, as I, I saw one evangelical say, he said, "I know that I 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 know there's a God." Well, it's, it, he may as well have just said, I like to pretend that there's a God, because that's all he's saying. Yeah. He doesn't actually know that. So I have a question then for you, Aaron, here, and that is this. Uh, I, I, I'm hearing two different things from you. I'm hearing you say that faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction, and I'm also hearing you say that there are people who say this, but they know that they don't know which means that faith isn't really that. They're just saying that's what it is. So my, my question to you is this. Um, is this just your rejection of what they claim faith is? Or are, do, you, do you actually really, I, I mean, because if they're not really doing that, they're doing something else. And you were, you're conjecturing that uh, they're probably just making dishonest statements. So, um, so in that case, faith is a dishonest assertion <laughs> of certainty. Um, rather than, um, but so my question is, are, are you pushing back against what, how they define faith, or are you pushing back against the actual cognitive operation of faith? Or, so I'm not, that's not, it's something I'm not clear on. Okay, well, it's really both, because they're consistent. I mean, the way that they define faith, or the way that the mainstream defines faith, it's never the way that when you're arguing with a faithful person that they, that they admit that that's what it is. I mean, it's, uh, the they want to change the definition, but eventually you reveal in the conversation that I'm actually using the right definition. I mean, in all the definitions, uh, both in the Bible and what I've seen in the Quran and in the Bhagavad Gita, it's not even Abrahamic religions. This is like all religion has the same concept of faith. Faith is something you convince yourself to believe. And it's something that you're going to make yourself believe if you could just believe hard enough, which means it's really, literally, it's make-believe, it's pretend. And, and it, everything is rewarded by those who believe, if you could just make yourself believe. And so these people will tell me that, you know, it, 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 they don't look at it as a, as a rational attempt to understand any kind of a reality. It's not, they don't want to understand, they want to believe. And it's the, it's the, it's the Tinkerbell, clap your hands if you want her to, to, to be alive again. It's, it's, it's that kind of emotional, literal make-believe that I'm against, because especially when it is dishonestly asserted as though it were knowledge. Now, if you tell me that you're convinced of something and you can't give me a reason that you're convinced about it, well, then I don't, we don't have anything to talk about, really. I naively thought, you know, I think we all think that everybody else is just like we are, right? I mean, I, and I thought for the longest time that if I ask anybody, why do you believe whatever you believe, that I'm going to get a series of reasons that are indicative of that conclusion. And I would be, and that they should be good enough that it would convince me to say, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. I guess I believe that too. This is what I would think. And it was, I'm embarrassed to say that I was in my 30s before I finally started asking people to, speci to specify what is the reason that led you to this conclusion? Why do you believe this? And getting the admission dozens of times that 
ultimately that it isn't a reason. I believe that because I want to. I believe that because I have to. I want to. I believe that because I want to be able to. I want to think that when I die, I'm going to be able to see my my dead son again or my dead father again. These are not. These are. This is not evidence. Okay. Uh, let, let, let me extend this a little bit more in a different way. Uh, let's say that I'm a, a police investigator. And uh, I've been called in to interrogate a particular person. And let's say that at the beginning of this interrogation, I, I have not heard anything about the facts. I'm just here to uh, inquire if this person's the first inquiry I've done. And I ask this person a, a question about whether or not uh, they have any knowledge of the event that we're investigating. And they say to me, no. And I find myself believing that they are lying and the reason that I'm believing that they're lying is because when they answered the question, they shifted their weight in their chair. They also touched their eyebrows, scratched their, their face, looked away from me in an odd way. And then uh, as soon as they had said no and they thought that I had taken their answer well, they gave me a quick smile of relief. Now, <clears throat> as a person who has actually studied lying, I know that those are the kinds of things that liars do, but other people do them too. But the fact that this came in such a cluster causes me to believe they're lying. But as yet, I don't really know that they are lying, but I do believe they are lying. Now, there's a sense in which that's not based on any evidence of proof that they are lying, but it is based upon some sort of observation that is statistically correlated with what it is we know about lying. So would you consider that a kind of faith or a kind of belief? We and, either, and how, yeah. would, how would we differentiate that from? Okay. okay. We either base our beliefs on reason or we base our beliefs on faith. So you have evidence of a, you have a series of facts that are consistent with that hypothesis. They're showing indications that imply that they might be lying. So that, now, there's nothing to say. And yet I don't really know that they are. Well, I, you I, you don't just, really know. Right. Yeah. But you have reason to believe. Right. You have reason to believe. And uh, other people would say, well, he's probably lying. Why? Because he's just that sort of person. That's not a reason to believe. That's that's going with a base judgment. Can I well, then, go ahead? Go ahead. Well, I'm trying to establish some commonality here in in what we what we think, and it goes off of what you're what you're going for, Bob. Is when we're ideas don't arrive in a, arise in a vacuum, and so we're either going to attribute this sense of otherness that people have with something that's just isolated to human beings and that's a quirk about us and we kind of personify the world and, and that sort of thing or it could be that there is something more and we don't know so we're trying to establish justification on which which path to go down and it's not one about knowing it's that uh the view that I take is uh, is that no one can choose what they believe. It, it it appears to us, and then we explore it, and we get justification. When we when we're talking about gods, we are never going to have evidence for some transcendent being. We are going to have nature, you and me, and that's it. So you and I cannot talk about evidence for God. There's not going to ever be any. So we have an impression that that you have a different one than I do. Uh, are an, or maybe you have this sense of other, but you attribute it to being human. I don't know, but you have to account for that. And so reason is the only thing available to you and for me at the same time. And what it boils down to is what Bob is hinting at, which epistemologically, there's nothing in logic itself uh, that would make either one of us choose two sound arguments that are in direct opposition to each other. So outside of reason, we are looking at the impressions that we have of the world leading us to uh, accepting some kind of logical framework to explore it under. So for me, I have an impression of some big other in the world, and I realize it's a transcendent being. I don't make any knowledge of things at all. So my, I don't have any faith, but I do have a belief, which is an attitudinal disposition towards that state of affairs. And my 
talking about God or Jesus or anything else that I would, uh, the Tao or, or whatever, whatever I want to involve myself to try and understand this uh, uh, impression I have and its implication uh, is a way for me to talk about it. Uh, and so I'm trying to see if that is something that, that you would think that faith has to come into play or that you and I are dealing with the question of God on different footing or with different tools. Uh, is that something that you can address? Let me, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying that you're convinced that an actual deity really exists. No. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is I have an impression of something, and I have to make sense of that impression. So we, you and I both, I would say, are making an inference to the best explanation. It's just that in your explanation of things, you don't have to account for the same impressions that I do, but I do, which is why some uh, uh, theological statements make sense and where it should not uh, interest you at all. Because that, why would you try and account for something that it just doesn't matter to you? You know, there's another important point to bring up, which is a, is a different context. Like when Bob uh, is talking about that he has reasons to believe that such a per that, that this person may be lying to him. When Bob investigates, as he is describing himself as an investigator, he's going to investigate this matter to see whether that person is lying to him. And if it turns out that you know he, that he can show that the, what the person said is correct, and that the person obviously knew that it was correct and never and never tried to mislead him, well then Bob should be satisfied that no, that his initial belief was incorrect. But with a religious belief, the context is different. See, believers are believers because they believe with an act of will. It's not when I believe something, you know, whatever I believe is a, is a logical consequence of my understanding of the information, and it will obligately change according to my changing understanding with new information. But, but with faith, the belief doesn't change. Faith fits the definition of it, the psychological definition of a delusion, which is a fixed false belief that will not change despite evidence to the contrary. So if Bob was determined before he ever even talked to that person, there's something telling him that you, this person's going to lie to you. He's got a book that says, you know, that anybody that tells you anything different than this is lying to you, and you must never believe them. So even if he can show that the person didn't lie, and all the evidence indicates that the person didn't lie, Bob's going to continue to believe that person lied because he's required to believe that person lied. He's not allowed to change his mind. That's the difference between you know the religious faith concept, concept and a rational belief. Sure. Does does every theist or believer uh, you say that that's the case with everyone? It's an act of will. No, no, it's not. It be, there are people who believe what they do for for rational reasons. I mean, this is where uh, uh, some people have named an actual philosophical uh, concept of, of after me, Aaron Ross Fork, where. Uh, I say that uh, you can you can be an honest creationist, for example, I and mean, everybody around you is creationist. You didn't you don't know much about the science. You don't much know much about the theology either. Everybody believes in creation because they live in South Texas. So, and there's a lot awful lot of smart people who believe this. So there's got to be something to it, even if you can't understand it. So you 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 trust in their authority. That's fine. That's honest. But then when you come to someone who is well versed in these arguments, who actually knows both. The failings of theology and the uh, you know, like, like uh, so many of our best uh, best atheist activists are former believers, and they understand the holes in religion, right? And then let's uh, say somebody that simultaneously also understands the evolutionary biology and geology and so forth, they can explain it. So you get somebody like me who spends all their time doing this argument. You will uh, th that honest believer will very quickly find themselves having to make a choice whether to remain honest or whether to remain creationist because it is no longer possible to be both. When you say there's no beneficial mutations and there's no, uh, there's no transitional species and, and macroevolution has never been observed and so on, and I go and disprove every one of those things, what I will usually see is people, they won't, they won't admit that I, that I proved that point. They'll, they'll change the subject. Well, well, let's talk about this. No, 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 no. The transitional species. You understand what a transitional species is. Here are 300 examples. Admit that there are transitional species. They won't. They can't, because it's forbidden to admit this. 
So they've taken a dishonest step. If they admit this, then they're still being honest and they're not going to be creationist. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So the, there's a group that you would uh, definitely put in that circle with your use of faith and the ramifications for that. I think I would agree 100%. Uh, well, I, don't if, think there's, I don't think there's anybody that actually uses faith differently. Um, I would completely disagree I, I would with you, to, Aaron. Uh, I made some comments on um you said uh, yourself yeah. that there can never be evidence of god right sure sure but there are a whole lot of people who really believe there is a god right yes i'm one of them belief with you just said you told me that you you are not convinced that there's an that an actual deity really exists that's correct but belief as far as psychology is concerned and uh, epistemological philosophy belief is an attitude it's a disposition it's a commitment to act so when i have an impression i don't control what the impression is i simply acknowledge that i have it and then what do i do to uh to rule out whether it's not just me or if there's something else about the place that i'm in that causes me to have these thoughts and i need to explore those too okay. so for me uh, Theology is an exploration of what it could be that I'm experienced. So I'm having a very real experience and theology is what I'm using to describe it or kind of frame it so that there's a, a human benefit to the enterprise at all. Now, if I could rule it out logically, I would have years ago, but the impression still remains. And if I could rule it out logically, then I would. And then I would just be stuck with the impression and wow, aren't, don't we have this neat little, uh, you know, quirk about humanity. But it's, you know, it's not that it's something that I want to have this disposition towards thinking that way. It's just that that's what I do and I recognize that I have it. So I have a belief, but I do not have faith. And for me personally, I don't care philosophically. It does not matter if we know the answer to the question, if there's a God or not, because from, from what you're saying that I have said is we can't know anything about God, okay. then what we believe is what's important about uh, about what we're doing. What we're saying about God is what's important, not that it actually attaches to God, because it can't. It can't be a matter of knowledge what I'm saying when I'm talking about God. Okay. The, the Does first, that make sense? The first thing we were talking about was the definition of faith, which whenever I get to talking with believers, usually that's the first thing to go under attack. So that's that's what I have to defend first. And you're telling me that you have a belief in a God and that there's never going to be any evidence of that God. So that proves that my definition was correct. I don't think so. I think that's conflation. Um, how? how? Well, how? If, if I said I, that faith is a belief that is not based on evidence, he says he has a belief doesn't mean it's not based no on evidence. Me. Does that, that doesn't not prove my but, but here's, if I were talking to a person who is seriously paranoid, and I asked them if they could define for me what being paranoid would mean, uh, chances are they're going to leave themselves out of that definition. People who use a coping mechanism, and many times I'll admit faith can be a coping mechanism, will always have a very distorted uh, uh, definition and idea. And, and the truth is, I would never, <clears throat> as a therapist, and not that I am a therapist, but I certainly have a degree in human development, which included uh, the development of cognitive uh, abilities and skills, including the psychological um, context we find ourselves in. When a person uh, who's paranoid tries to define paranoia, I would not. Uh, I would not accept their definition as being an accurate definition of what paranoia is, nor of what they're doing. And the same thing's true if I was talking to someone with a borderline personality disorder. So when you're talking to people who have uh, an unreasonable faith, why would you even believe that their definition of faith? is even an accurate one. I mean, when I go I out- That's what I, that's exactly what I, watch, I said. Here's the I point. Don't believe, I don't believe- When I believe. go out to the golf course and I see somebody hit a hole in one, uh, that for me is evidence, I guess, that that a, a hole in one is possible. You can come in. That people can do that kind of thing. When I find people who believe something, I don't necessarily think they believe what they believe for the reasons they state, uh, but, I think that if it's a human being and they're believing something, there's something <coughs> causing them to believe it. Maybe I don't understand it. Maybe they don't understand it. But I think that it's impossible for a human being to, to have the kind of faith you're talking about. To have an unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against reason is, is maybe only what it looks like on the surface. Something else is going on. 
So and when you when you can, wake up, can I jump in? Hold, hold uh, on for a minute. We have uh, Michael Harden. He wants to jump back in. He's on the phone, and so oh. we're going to have to be very, very patient. But before he says anything, because I think that he has a lot to add to the conversation, simply because he's this skeptical theologian. Most people are not aware that theologians are typically extremely skeptical. John Bishop. This guy is he's very good at what he does, okay? He said, faith is a broad term. These are his words, not mine. He said, faith is a broad term appearing in locutions that express a range of different concepts. He goes on, he says, there is no singular established terminology for different models, namely of faith. A brief in initial characterization of the principal models of faith in their nomenclature as they feature, namely in the discussion that he was having, it goes like this, and I'm reading this. He says, the purely affective model, that is a faith, faith is a feeling of existential confidence. Number two, it's true that in, in the church you have this special knowledge model, namely of faith. Faith as knowledge of a specific truth revealed by God. But let's move on. This is what he writes as a theologian. He said, the belief model, faith as a belief that God exists, where the object of belief is a certain proposition. So he's talking about different kinds of faith here, okay? We move on. The trust model, faith as believing in, in the sense of trusting in, namely God, where the object of belief or trust is not a proposition, but God himself. Let me move on to the next one. The doxastic, yes, I said doxastic venture model, namely of faith. Faith is a practical commitment beyond the evidence to one's belief that God exists. He goes on and he starts talking about this sub-doxastic and non-doxastic venture model. He says... Faith is a practical commitment to a rel relevant, positively evaluated truth claim, yet without belief. So this is all over the place here. He goes on to say that there's also a hope model when it comes to faith. In other words, faith is hoping or acting in the hope that, namely that God, who actually saved or who saves, actually exists. And so we have different models out there of faith. We have different usages. And so I'm simply asking the question, is John Bishop right in that he's saying faith is a broad term, number one, appearing in various locutions, expressing a wide range of different concepts? Is he right or is he wrong, Aaron Ra? Are you muted? Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, I keep forgetting that I've done that once. Okay. I was because I, when, I, when you I'm when you sorry, make your I, I thought that the question was was uh, aimed at, at Harden perhaps or for the for the group in general. There was some points that needed to be addressed that had just been brought up, and, I, and I'm afraid of moving on without addressing those. Okay. Things. Let's go back to Michael Harden since he's having a hard time talking okay. here. Michael, did I say anything that resonates with the theologian? Here? One here is that there's, there's not a singular definition of any particular term, theological term. Different faith traditions have different definitions. We all know this. Any of us that have studied the 40-plus thousand Protestant denominations, let alone the history of the Christian Church. Second, I think part of the problem here for me in this discourse is that what we're doing fundamentally, or what I see being done fundamentally, is a repetition of the questions that were asked by Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, then reframed by Immanuel Kant on the continent in the early 19th century, brought in through the logical positivism school of Vienna into this theory of science that is proposed by the Christian fundamentalist, and, it, and it, the presuppositions are bought into by the atheists who assume, who assume, A, all Christians think like fundamentalists. We don't. Fundamentalists are a minority of the Christian church. They may be a big 
ch- a bigger chunk here in the United States of America and in certain parts of Africa. But in terms of Christendom as a whole, fundamentalists and evangelicals are a sliver. Having said that, I think it's important to broaden the conversation. So, for example, when uh, Aaron Ross says, most theologians, I want to ask, really, does that include Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Karl Barth? Does it include Karl Rahner? Does it include Jürgen Moltmann, Wolfhard Pannenberg? Does it include philosophers like Paul Ricoeur? Does it include um, anthropologists like René Girard? I mean, the the, the thing is, if you're only reading fundamentalists and evangelicals and reacting against them, you're just reacting against a small minority. Now, I also understand that Aaron has a very vested interest in this because, doggone it, if the fundamentalists are trying to get creation, creationism, I should say, into the school systems in Texas, and man, I am 100% behind him in that battle. You know, keep it out. It's pseudoscience. Having said that... That doesn't mean there is not and has not been an interface between theology and science for close to 50 years. Thomas Torrance in the 50s and 60s, John Polkinghorn in the 80s, um, gosh, Alistair McGrath, uh, there, there are so many others. And, and then we haven't even begun to discuss the hermeneutical issue, the interpretation issue, with that faces both science and theology as rational enterprises, so, for example, we haven't discussed Michael Polanyi and the phenomenon of tacit knowledge. We have not yet discussed the importance of hypotheses and forming theses in science. We haven't discussed yet, for example, if I say, you know, tell me about an atomic particle, and you can say, well, here's its weight, here's its mass, here's its speed, and I say, but what does it smell like, and what is its name? And you say, well, atomic particles don't smell, and they don't have a name, and I want to go, how do you know? How do you know? You don't know. You've not done the experiments to verify or deny. You just have made a claim. This is the major problem I have right now, is that the Richard Dawkins, the Prices, and others who are uh, rightly, in a sense, um, going after this Christian fundamentalism, I would go after that bad theological thinking, too, because here's the reality that is that Iran is absolutely correct in. The evangelical of the fundamentalist has faith in their faith. He's absolutely dead on about this. They have faith in their faith. And their faith is a certain set of propositions. You know, God made the world in six days, or God poured his wrath out on Jesus, or Jesus is coming back and boy, is he pissed. You know, these kinds of... And to react against that is something that both Aaron Ra is doing as an atheist and I'm doing as a theist. So in a sense... The friend of my uh, enemy is my friend, you know, and that's what makes our relationship, I think, kind of interesting. But I would love to bring the discourse away from this kind of uh, naive epistemological framing that's been going on here for a while. I mean, the fact is, is that one of the, the areas that I do research in is neuroscience, and I'm always interested in the... Um, stuff that's going on in neuroscience and with regard to issues of faith and the things that, that, you know, basically, you know, faith gives you a little oxytocin rush. Well, great, you know. If the human is hardwired and needs an oxytocin rush and faith does it, then great, have faith. I'm, I'm really much more interested in asking how it is that there's the ubiquity of sacrifice across the human species and that across the human species, both diachronically and synchronically, why are the gods always sacrificial? To me, that's the big question. Why are the gods violent? That's the key question. Not whether God exists or not, because you, you need a theory of religion that explains the violence of the gods. That, to me, is the cutting-edge question. Aaron. Let's see. Right. If, if I may address that, at, at, at no point did I ever give any indication or imply in any way that all Christians think like fundamentalists or believe like fundamentalists. In fact, I often cite Polkinghorne and other Christians who are uh, who, who are scientists themselves and who support mainstream science. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say that it needed to be addressed, it was brought up a few moments ago, was an, an impression or a suspicion is not the same thing as a conviction. A belief is a conviction. A lack of belief is a lack of conviction. So if you believe, then you are convinced. 
but if but if you only have an impression, then you're not convinced, but you're only considering the possibilities. And all I said about, about that was about what everybody believes. It is is that the definition that faith is a belief that is not held on evidence. That's what was supported. Here. If, so if we say that um, you're but science science does the same thing. Sci science. This is one of the interesting things about the philosophy of science. When you get into the philosophy of science, for example, like Michael Polanyi. What you discover is that the scientist's basic epistemology is fundamentally faith-based. That is, the scientist is, the, the language that's used now in the literature on intentionality is that the scientist possesses an openness to the universe. That is, there's, the, the debate is between things that are given and, and things that are, are, are coherent. There's a great book on this, The Problem of Perception and the Experience of God. That's a Fortress Press book. I can get you the author's name if you want. The point is here, we've got to move the, these arguments uh, away from, uh, again, more naive approaches to scientific method and scientific methodology into much more interdisciplinary types of, of conversations um, so for example, you know, I, I don't, when I read Iran's statement, you know, I, again, I understand the context for it and I'm fundamentally in agreement with regard to the way he's presenting faith. And I know who that he's referring to. He's referring to the fundamentalists and the evangelicals. That's not faith for me. Yeah, his definition of faith is not my definition, and I thought that was important that you read that there are these de several definitions. I'm sitting here looking at a close to a 500-page Ox Oxford Press book called Roman Faith and Christian Faith, and all it is is a lexicographical study of the term pistis and fides for about 500 years. We can't afford to be narrow in our conversations. We can't afford to just tar and feather. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so are you convinced that an actual deity really exists? That's psychology, though. When you're talking about epistemology, you're talking about justification. How okay, do we he know? said that I'm using the wrong definition. So if it's not a belief that is not held without that is held without evidence, then he has a belief. He has to have evidence. If he doesn't have evidence, he, if he has a belief and he doesn't have evidence, then my definition is correct. Well, the, again, uh, but here's the thing, you and I, for example, let me just stop you for a second here, because you and I had a conversation, it was the second time we were together on the New Covenant Group show, about the historical Jesus. Now, this is something I've been involved in for 40 years. I have been through the Jesus Seminar at the AARSB all meetings. This is something I know inside and out. I have been trained as a historian. I understand how to do history. I do primary research in historical documents. Wow, okay, so then you start off by quoting Price and a few other rather fringe scholars, and I'm sitting here, I'm going, nobody practices history like that in classical literature, medieval literature, biblical literature, we just, that's absurd to be practicing history like that, but nobody wants to hear that. The atheists just want to go, oh no, this is how you do history, I'm going, no it isn't. Okay, so we first of all have to really vet that. the sources here, let's vet our sources. Okay. Once again, you, you, if you want to have a conversation that we had a year ago, we can do that. But it seems that they had they wanted to have this conversation today. They wanted to talk yeah, about you're, faith. You're, but if faith. I tell you I have faith, and I start to give you the reasons for it. So, for example, if I start to tell you how I know Jesus existed and how I can determine things that he said and this and that and the other, you're going to come back with that standard atheist, William Price, uh, Bart Ehrman type, you know, Jesus didn't exist, that, 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 they proven it. No, just because three or four scholars are out there saying this doesn't make it true. Well, if, if you want to argue about things you imagine that I might say that I wouldn't actually say in that conversation, then you can go do your own podcast and play my part, because that's not what I would have said. And that's also not what we're talking about today. We're talking about. And, uh, and I'm trying to bring it back to what we are talking about. You, you did say, Iron, here just a moment ago that you recognize, you do recognize that fundamentalism and evangelicalism are but a sliver of the entire Christian history. Mm -hmm. So my question is this: um, <clears throat> Do you think that all those other Christians don't have faith, or, or if they do have faith, is their faith an unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended uh, against all reason? Is that true of them as well? 
or is this so i mean who is this aimed at just that sliver of people or are you aiming it at all people who claim that they really do believe okay. in let me give you the distinction as i just i gave you the the you know, r and ross fork right where you can have an honest believer and then they, they, they come to this position where they have to make a decision right whether they're going to follow what's actually true or whether they're going to believe what they want to believe regardless what's true you, you okay, so you're, here you're assuming here you're assuming that these people who do have faith but aren't fundamentalists are primarily people who haven't done their homework and, and that's an assumption on your part which i think is 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 quite wild Okay, uh, because I, I, I think we have assuming. people from years ago who are not fundamentalists, who who certainly represent an amazing level of scholarship for their day. You know. Okay. Well, you're 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 assuming that I'm assuming things that I'm. I, not I know. I'm, I'm asking. I don't know what you're doing because I'm a little confused at what you're saying. I can't quite apply this definition to everything you're saying about faith. Okay. I think we got to go back to the definition that was given by Iran right at the beginning. Anybody that has faith is irrational. I did say. So I take, that, that, I take that as a personal kind of statement. I'm going, oh, well, I have faith, therefore I'm irrational in Iran's view. And I think, well, that's not fair. Being convinced of something without evidence, yeah, is irrational by, by definition. You should never. Okay, well, then, it, then, then here's the thing. Then we need to start having conversations about what constitutes evidence. You know, and now we're getting into the science, you know, of, of, of what constitutes science, what constitutes scientific method. My God, we could just go round and round and round and round in circles. I mean, I've, I'm sitting here with a stack of books I grabbed just for just for tonight's, you know, exercise and on the integration of theology and science. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that there probably is not an atheist out there that's reading this literature. I mean, do you are you aware of the move the movement? It's not a movement yet, but the um, growing uh, group of uh, Christian atheistic scholars. <laughs> they're atheists, but they're also Christian. That is, they, they, it's a strange thing, but they're atheists. Now, there's actually Laron Schultz in Norway is a, a, a pioneer of this. Good friend of mine. You know, I mean, you, you there's all these that. conversations that are happening that aren't being taken into consideration. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, well, what, one of the things that you actually did say was that science has a lot of faith, is based on faith. That's absolutely wrong. Science is the... Well, you're told me, are you saying Michael Polanyi, great British time, philosopher, whose, whose work has been lauded and accepted and used in the philosophy of science, are you telling me Michael Polanyi was wrong? If Michael Polanyi says that science is based on faith, he's wrong. Science is the antithesis well, of faith in all of its operations. First of all, it is never wise to believe something said by another without question, without reservation, or without reason, right? You'd have to put all your, your, your trust in authority to do that. And that is not what science does. You have to have evidence already in order to back any postulation. A scientist can't okay. say what- give me, give, me one, give me one shred of evidence for string theory. <laughs> that, that's the beautiful thing about science. Scientists hate string theory because there's nothing for it but mathematics. There's no evidence of it, and yet, exactly. and yet, exactly. it's that's becoming more and more popular it. as a model of explaining the universe. But uh, it's I, only a model. I In fact, there are many scientists who would claim that even though we can't prove string theory, mm -hmm. string theory is the only way that we've even been gotten close to uh, and this, is all, and, and this is all I'm trying to say, is that at this point, scientists engage faith. That is, they're, they're engaging faith in a theory that basically says it makes m the most sense of most of the data, but it's only a theory. And yes, then they use that to even devise theory. experiments, or, or yeah. the first they have to devise the, the um, equipment to do the experiments. Okay. Understand, understand uh, Michael, that, that while you said something that was grossly mistaken, that science is based on faith, you then followed that up by calling me naive, which was just adding irony to the whole thing. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. Theory, so if, string, string who was that? Not, string theory is not even a theory. It doesn't even qualify as a theory. 
And it's not faith. You're using the context of trust, perhaps, for some people that may be the case. But it's not the same as a religious faith. Then, let, then, let, then let's do a real-life experiment. Let's go back to 1945 to the Trinity site. Before they detonated that bomb, Oppenheimer was, and the scientists were not sure that it would not create a massive chain reaction and destroy the Earth. They were not sure. So where, they had where did you get the impression Google, they, then? When they where pressed that button, they did it strictly okay. on faith. All right, Michael, once again, we base our beliefs on reason or we base our beliefs on faith. And in this case, you're talking about scientists who had worked out the math and showed good reason to show the limitations of this explosion. So they have reasons to believe what they do. And it turned out during the test, because that's another thing that works against the operation. Well, it, as I said next. to you previously, I have great reasons for believing what I believe. The thing is you dismiss all my reasons and evidence without without actually engaging. Someone else on this panel already said there can be no such thing as as evidence of no, God. So a you... statement. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't agree with that. In fact I would say this that um, I think it's very mistaken when scientists talk about evidence speaking, because evidence doesn't speak without methods. And the, the whole concept behind the scientific method is not that there is something that we call the scientific method, but rather that science uses methods to, uh, to draw conclusions. Uh, and the methods that they develop are tested and, and verified and validated so as to determine that we can seem to draw some consistent conclusions from the artifacts we examine. But we have often had those artifacts to examine with no conclusions to draw before we had any methods. Uh, an example of that would be blood types or fingerprints. Before we had done developed any methods for determining what these things are or how consistent they are, we were not able to draw any real conclusions from an actual fingerprint other than that it looks like a fingerprint. So the, the question then becomes, is there evidence for God? Well, the problem that we have with even that question, is there evidence for God, is this. If God does exist, and if God created the universe, then every single particle in existence is evidence of that. However, the problem we have is we have more evidence than we know what to do with, and that's the actual problem. We don't have any methods for studying the evidence that we have to determine if there's any God's presence uh, present or any God's absent in, in the process. We have no methods for doing this. And so until we develop some sort of a methodology, the question of evidence is really just, um, is really just a smokescreen. No, because evidence is a body of facts which are positively indicative of or exclusively concordant with one available conclusion over any other. And, and so how do we get to that? Uh, how do we get to that definition without any kind of method? Well, you, sure, you have a method, but that's irrelevant to what you just said. No, no, I'm saying the method is the foundation of it all, and that the evidence is simply the object that is explored. Absolutely. Oh, the point. The point Absolutely. I'm how do you how do you evaluate evidence without a predetermined method? How do you know what kind of an experiment to do? How do, how do you know? I mean, what does an atomic particle smell like? The point what I'm is its trying, name? The point I'm trying to make is if every single atom in the universe would still be every single atom in the universe, regardless whether God existed or not, then every single atom in the universe is just a fact. It's not evidence. It doesn't become evidence until it aligns with one or the other options, or it, 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 or it aligns... It, it contradicts one of those options, so it indicates one or the other. When it indicates one or the other, then it becomes evidence. I was simply trying to indicate that science asks certain questions and not others. That's all. Okay, so what science does is, in order to postulate anything, they can't just do base speculation, that's meaningless. Until there's a way to test for it, there has to be a way to show that there's some reality. You have to show that there's a, that there's a there there. So whenever they say, well, maybe there's a magical anthropomorphic immortal that, no, that nobody could ever test and nobody could ever isolate and there's no way we could ever prove it wrong. Okay, fine, you go play by yourself. We're gonna do real work over here. And, and so see, instead, somebody says, well, I've got this fact, right? And, and, and this fact, how do I explain this? I th or, or I think this indicates this other thing. So we come up with a hypothesis. Okay, good, you've got a fact, you've got a hypothesis. This is consistent with your hypothesis. Now, how do we test it? to make sure that it's right. This is exactly opposite of faith. Faith has the assertion without the fact, and here we have the fact, and now we're gonna test the assertion. And the problem with faith is it's unfalsifiable. There's nothing that could ever prove or prove that the, that the God hypothesis is wrong because there's just people that will say that they're gonna believe what they wanna believe no matter what. And but it's- the, it's a, not, the, 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 Carl Popper, 
Popper's criterion of falsifiability has also been falsified. Yes, <laughs> yes. Let me ask you a question here. If I do some tests uh, of pure distilled water and I'm at um, I'm at uh, sea level, and I consistently discover that I can freeze the water at zero degrees Celsius and then I get it boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, and I and I find that this is just absolutely consistent. Um, do I now believe that water boils at 100, or do I know that it boils at 100 degrees Celsius? Knowledge is demonstrable. So if you can show that there's a consistency there, you can demonstrate that knowledge. Right, and I would agree with that. And so therefore, I would say that knowledge is not belief. And, well, and not, that, knowledge is a subset of belief, but it's justified well, through belief. If I, 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 I disagree with that, but that's another, that's another debate. Um, uh, we can show justified true beliefs that are still not really based on any kind of okay, knowledge. Well, let me, let me I, would, that. I would also I, like to I, point I out that we've not addressed the elephant in the room, and that's for about 50 years, so-called science has been funded by the military-industrial complex. So-called <laughs> science has determined what we can believe and what we can't believe. So-called science gives us, uh, depending on who's funding it, one answer one day, a different answer the next day. Today, coffee's bad for you. The next day, it's good for you. It's all about the funding, and nobody's stopping to question that. And this is a major problem right now in science, as you know, with regard to all the debates in and around climate change. The so-called scientists that claim there is no climate change, while well, the vast majority do. It's who's funding the research. Okay. And that's Michael the seems to have a number of different topics he would like to talk about. Well, there aren't thinking. any of them this topic, the topic that I was brought on to talk about. Uh, if, if, I, if I can interject something, I think what Michael is doing, he's trying to give a very large umbrella to the conversation, simply because when I read a few minutes ago, and I, I would like your thoughts on this, um, John Bishop simply stated that faith is a broad term. I keep repeating this because... I think that if we think that faith only has this one usage, I think that that's um, um, a little, not just a little bit off, but way off. Would you agree with that? I mean, is, is this guy wrong? Yes, I do. I, I think to call faith irrational is irrational. So that's why, you know, we have the term in Christmas, it is for Oh, okay. Faith seeking understanding. That's what faith does. It seeks understanding. It doesn't believe in itself or buy into itself or just God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No. Fidians quaerans intellectum. You know, this is Anselm's proslogian. We are those who seek to understand what all that we can name is this transcendence experience of G D. And we are seeking understanding of that. And to call that irrational to me is, uh, I don't know. Um, well, the only it's way bothersome on many levels, yeah. So, so Michael has now defined faith as science, which is no, no, science no, no, is no, no, seeking no, understanding. No. And the only way to improve your understanding of anything is to seek out the flaws in your current perspective and correct them, which means you have to have some way of testing which which terms are correct and which ones are incorrect and which direction is the correction so that you're not just continuously more wrong. And then we have tens of thousands of different denominations just within one of hundreds of religions. So obviously that's not following the right course. Whereas if you walk away from any religion, it doesn't matter what religion you walk away from. If you walk away from all religions altogether, if you walk away from faith entirely, then you end up going in the opposite direction where you zero in on the one and only evident truth. And that's what science well, is. It's exactly the let me, let, me throw, let me throw this out there. In order for that to happen, you'd also have to walk away from something. One of the interesting things that uh, my medic theorists have done, particularly Paul Mich Dumachel in Japan and Jean-Pierre Dupuis in Paris, France, they have shown how since the Enlightenment, the modern economy now plays the same role in society that archaic religion did previously. That means that everybody, to be free from economies of exchange, because that's what religion is, and that's why I brought up earlier the importance of this business of the sac of sacrificing the gods, the economies of exchange, we are, we are embedded in them right now 
uh, for our very existence. So to walk away from religion would also be for everybody in modernity to walk away from the economy. I don't see that happening. Obviously, you don't have to walk. What a religion is, what all, every religion universally accepted as such by both its adherents and its critics, is a faith-based belief system holding to the notion that some essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical body to continue on in some supernatural form. Obviously, you can get rid of that with having no impact at all on your economy. So that's, I'm sorry, that's that's a failed association. So when you say that religion, and you said this falsely, by the way, when you said that what, that faith is, is seeking to understand, well, then how then that you and a number of other people who also have faith-based beliefs, but they're different than yours, how do you gather together to find out which of your beliefs is the more accurate and thus convince the others to change their minds so that you change so well, that you change there's, the direction there's, of there's, a, there's a simple criterion I use for that and that's that any faith that does not move me to care more for the other than myself is not faith so that's my simple criteria so when I see selfish faith when I see uh, uh, in this Jesus loves me, this I know faith, when I see God's going to prosper me, when I see all that, I call bullshit on that. Real authentic faith, real spirituality, really moves a person out of themselves to love others. That, for me, is genuine faith. And so when I see that, it doesn't matter whether I see it in a Christian or a Buddhist or an atheist, or whatever, when I see that genuine expression of love where persons are actually, you know, um, uh, giving of themselves to the other, that for me is a visible expression of faith. That, that's what constitutes faith for me. I do not buy into religion and all of its, its God will bless me bullshit. Okay, so we've got, we've got most of the planet then that's involved in the Protestants versus the Catholics or the Muslims versus the Jews or the Christians versus yep. the Indians yep. and yep. so forth. So yep. everybody's faith is valid. Which is why we've got to get back to the question of God and violence. What's the relationship between God and violence? We and solve that. You, I can tell we you. We solve that. We solve that. that. It's because. the fact that there is no evidence by which anybody, any group of people who have different beliefs, can, different religious beliefs, can establish which one of them is the more accurate and thus change everybody's mind. That's why religion well, shards onto into ever more thousands a, of different but, but, denominations. But when I have conversations with Jews or, or Muslims, it's not about accuracy. It's not about certainty. That's the problem of that. modernity. Modern, the modern person seeks certainty, whether fundamentalist or atheist. It doesn't matter. Except that I'm not uh, seeking certainty. That. To that. To we move past the, the need for certainty. That's a dead end. And so when I talk I with, with I the general, I'm not. Of other I don't people. fit your your assertion. I'm not looking for certainty. Yes, you are. It's You're right. Uh, uh, understanding. And as I said, the only way to was is that when we is sit to down together, yeah, yeah, that we're, we're looking to see who's more accurate. We don't even think that way. I know. We're sitting That's together to know each other, to listen to each other's stories, to share, to so, share in each other's so, narratives, so, so, and to, to enter into the... Okay. Okay, so the only way to improve understanding is to seek out the, claw, the flaws in your current perception and correct them, and you can't do that if you won't allow that there even can be flaws in your current perception. So I'm not well, seeking let me, let me, the certainty. Let me give you an talking. example. Again, going back to the first show, I walked right into everything you said and affirmed it as you were going on and on about all the reasons why you didn't believe in God. I, and I sat and affirmed every last one of my greed, and I said, and I, and I started quoting Nietzsche. And that, that surprised you on air, that a theologian would quote Nietzsche, you know, positively. And the, the thing is, is that I, I listened to your story. I didn't sit there and go, oh, I'm going to deal with another fucking atheist or something. No, I listened. I, I cared, as, you know. I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting that. That's okay, all I'm trying to say. You said that science is based on faith. I can't let you make a mistake like that and then accuse me of being naive while you make a mistake like that and not correct it. I have to address that statement. Well, you know, I try to correct your bad science and you don't even listen. So I'm, I'm gonna, we're at an impasse here. We're just at a terrible okay, impasse. I don't know how to get out of it. Using bad it science. sounds to me yeah, like it sounds to me like one of the things that uh, it sounds to me like one, one of the things that uh, Michael Harden is actually saying is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. But you might even be suggesting that um, that uh, epistemism is here being asserted as an unreasonable conviction, and it is being defended against all reason. Um, Dr. Jones, if you could summarize that for me, it was cutting in and out. 
Okay, uh, Bob, state it again. Uh, okay, uh, Aaron is saying that faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction, which is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. And I, I'm saying that Michael seems to be suggesting that epistemism is an assertion of unreasonable conviction, which is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. I didn't hear him make any such statement. I, I did want to address something you said, Bob. Well, you, you did say that you know he, he's been trying to offer you some ideas about even science, and, and you won't even hear it. Well, yeah, because they're wrong. It's what can you do with this? When, when he says that science is based on faith, and everything about the scientific method is the antithesis of faith. Sorry, no. I gave you fallacy. an example. I didn't say science is based on, based on faith. I said I gave you an example of a philosopher of science who's widely acclaimed, because he's also a mathematician, who has given uh, a theory of what's known as the tacit dimension of knowledge in, mm -hmm. his, in his books. And he's, his argument is that knowledge first begins in faith. The simple exercise he uses for that as a philosopher of science is that when a blind person holds a cane and they're tapping the ground in front of them, they're not feeling their fingers touching the cane. Their senses literally extend down the instrument to the bottom of what they're tapping. And that cane functions as a tacit dimension for knowing. Polanyi argues that's in fact how ex all experiments function. And that's the role of faith as well. It's a tacit dimension of knowing. It's a way of knowing. Now, if you want scientific proof, if if, if, every, if the worldview you have says that without scientific proof, you're not going to buy it, great. Have that worldview. Absolutely fantastic. But for those of us that are rational human beings and caring and good, basically good people, for us to have faith, to call us irrational, it seems a bit disingenuous, I guess. Well, by the way, I'm only pushing back that, a little bit because you promised a great show, Dr. Jones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let, let, let me say something before anyone else uh, says anything. Like, like I said, if I lived in Texas, I'd be voting for Iran Raw for state senate. And I oh, hope yeah. all his Texas listeners vote for him. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. Well. I just also he, want to throw out there that if, if one. Am I allowed to do that on air? <laughs> I, what? I, Oh, hopefully so. And, and that if, we, if one guy uses faith, obviously in the context of trust, instead of in the context of religion, that does not undermine or overturn what the vast majority, the mainstream of all scientists hold as the antithesis of religious faith, faith in the religious context. Right. Now, let, let, let me state something for our audience and for everyone here. Our guests, uh, they like each other. I mean, a lot, okay? And uh, one of the things that's happening tonight is Michael Harden, he had some computer problems and we didn't have good audio. And so we have actually um, a telephone hooked up. Uh, it's not, we didn't hook it up to our rigging that actually does this. It was a, a patch job, if you will. And so Michael is actually on my cell phone, okay? Um, talking and it's very difficult for him to hear. He can't see anything going on and so if it seems like Michael is trying to interrupt Iron Ra, well that may be what's happening in the context of what people see, but in reality he's trying to wait and be patient and Iron Ra, if you can't tell, he's being very, very patient with Michael, understanding that he's limited because he can't see and so Let's be ever so kind and understanding in this context of the show, because yeah, there's, uh, there's just one last thing I wanted to yeah, mention. That something that Bob said earlier. Yeah, Bob said that uh, he didn't believe it was possible for people to hold the type of uh, fundamentalist religious faith that I mentioned when they brought up. You know, there was two aspects of this. When I said that that it, that faith was a belief that is not based on reason, I think Stephen. Uh, Stephen said himself that there can never be faith, or excuse me, there can never be evidence of God. So if you believe in God and you don't have evidence, well, that's a, that's obviously faith then. But then, then the other thing that I said that is also defended against all reason. I want to remind you, Bob, that the, the Institute for Creation Research, Answers in Genesis, creation.com, William Lane Craig, and many other theologians and creationists and so forth, do actually express this, that, that when, when there's a conflict between science and the Bible, that science got it wrong, that they will never allow any, any evidence of any kind to ever 
uh, to ever contest what they have to believe about the Bible. They phrase this many different ways, but a lot of people actually do hold that position. And so that is a defense against- No, there are people, who, claim, there are people who state their position that way mm -hmm. uh, because they're trying to talk in terms that they think. But that's are, actually what they do. That's what apologetics is. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that human beings cannot do what is humanly impossible to do. Okay. But, that, but it is I'll, humanly I think, I think these people are greatly naive and mistaken about why it is that they hold to their beliefs as strongly as they do. And the only reason why they claim that they do it against that kind of reason is because they don't know what else to say. And, and, and something that is very meaningful to them for reasons they can't articulate or possibly even reasons they don't even understand themselves uh, is, is being threatened and they can't let go of it. Now, to me, I would say that it strikes me more as a mental disease than, than, than a rational explanation. And I, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that although I know, and you're right, they, they say things like that. I think they have no idea what's going on inside of themselves, and I don't think they understand why they can't give oh. in or why they. Well, actually, I've actually seen to the contrary, where they do know what's going on. I mean, uh, as I, I may have told you before, I was in a movie called *My Week in Atheism* uh, by a, a theologian named uh, I call him a theologian, a Christian minister of some sort by named uh, John Christie. And after I was in his movie, I went and looked him up, uh, and I saw where he was giving sermons. He had made video recordings of his own sermons. He told his own congregation that he and they were delusional, that he believes what he wants to believe because that's going to make him happy, and he's not going to believe, he's never going to change his mind no matter what the evidence is. Okay, fine, I'm delusional, I don't care. He made so it. So he said that. That doesn't mean that's what he's really doing. That's just the way he's talking about it. And you know, well, you have to see the whole presentation to understand just how disingenuous it is. But well, I, I, I would uh, doubt that he was very disingenuous, but. Um, and I've seen the same same sort of thing many many times. You know, these but, but when the we're facts talking are, about what people say, and we talk about what cognitive operations actually occur within the human brain, I, I think we have to kind of recognize that we're we haven't established that any human being alive is really competently capable of really understanding all the operations of the brain, and yet many of us have uh, various theories, ideas, and I would even say beliefs uh, about how the brain operates. But, um, you know, and so these people are operating on, uh, on things that, that seem to, they seem to resonate with and make sense. But when they express it in such terms, I, I think that many times the certainty of faith that many people express is really their attempt to defend themselves uh, from being embarrassed. And it's not really based upon a conviction they actually hold on to. It's a, it's a, a face saving thing. Whereas I think you'll find that there are people like like Michael Harden, who who although he has a very real faith, I think that people like Stephen White, who has a very real faith, these are people who acknowledge that um, th there's great reason to wonder if they're even on the wrong path, or if there's a great number of things they're mistaken about. Uh, but then again, you know, my my faith in God is not a faith that I understand God but rather a, a comfort that I find in sensing that this experience I have of otherness, which cannot go away, and I don't know why it is there, and I don't know why it doesn't go away. It's been there all my life. But, but, the, but the idea of God, and not necessarily the certainty that I have about those ideas, are, are, are ideas that that, that I resonate with, that, that, that work well. And my reasons for holding on to them is this experience that I can't escape. And yet I acknowledge, maybe it's funny blood chemistry. Maybe it's, uh, maybe, maybe it's something strange going on. I, I don't claim to understand it. I don't claim to be able to defend it. But when I tell you that I'm a person of faith, I'm not actually even really making a claim about God's existence. I'm really just kind of confessing to you where I find myself. And yes. that's just it. Those are uh, d distinctions need to be made because I think we've gotten way off track as far as what needs to be discussed. We're talking about epistemism, and it is entirely a discussion that has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with justification. And there's a huge difference between belief and faith when we're talking about whatever you're saying, Aaron, has to apply in every situation 
in life. You can't think about truth and justification differently in one context than another. You can only talk about methods that you're going to use for justification, what qualifies. And I don't want to get into that. What I'm trying to say is that when I say I have an attitudinal disposition that something like a God may exist, I'm, I'm doing a speech act. I'm informing you rather than asserting to you that this is a state of affairs. I'm saying this is what I think. And so I'm just explaining to you that's what I think. Do I have fa uh, faith that that is actually the case? What I would be having faith in is saying that anything that I say about God, if I think it's true about God, that's what I have faith in. Well, that's, that, that's fine. And you have this impression, but that's different from a conviction. And right. It's like, and and it, even if you had a conviction, if, you, if your conviction is going to be changed by reason, or if it's based on reason, then it's not faith. Okay. Well, and what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that I have a belief that there is something like a God. I have no faith that anything I say about it is about God. Yet I am also a Christian because of the framework that I use to try and explain a language to try and explain what it is that I'm really experiencing. This would be empirical by way of experience. I'm trying to talk about it. Uh, and, and so when we talk about is faith a conviction? Well, no. Uh, is belief a conviction? No, it's more of a commitment. I'm, I'm driven this way. I don't have a choice in anything that I believe. What anybody believes, if they're if they're perfectly rational person, is what they think the case actually is. You cannot force yourself, unless you have some kind of bad psychology, to believe something that you think is true, but then go and say, uh, try and force yourself to believe that it's false. That's where you get actually there are people who have done that. And I know books on how they've done that, but I mean, and in, in preservation of religious belief. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it's, it's where you get all these different kind of psychoses. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I think that's what uh, a lot of people do because they can't do without, I think, committing to the actuality of what they're saying versus the impossibility about it being true about anything. There's no, what they can't uh, get their mind around is that there's no guarantee, no point of reference. That guarantees any meaning with what they're saying. And I'll bring that back around to what Michael is saying. What makes it valid, the point of reference that we're looking for, if we're going to say anything about a, a God at all, is human well-being. And when I'm saying that I think God is goodness, I'm not making an assertion that that is the case. I'm saying the only way that I can make sense of understanding anything I'd want to know about that God is through goodness. And is there something that would change my mind about it? What about human suffering and these kinds of things? What happens when I involve myself in uh, someone's uh, suffering in life or the betterment of somebody else's? It has, for me, theology is not something I'm committed to uh, in, in doxastic terms. What it is is a commitment to acting on what I think it's calling me to do, which is calling me to participate in goodness. None of that for me depends on there being a God. So I don't care about the question of whether or not God exists. Although I will admit my disposition is towards that way. I have no faith that there's a God because really I'm apotheistic when it comes to that. I don't care about the question. What I care about is what I'm telling me, uh, telling myself about the experience that I'm having that I am calling the experience of, of God. Now that may be poetry to me and helpful for me. I don't expect it to be helpful for you in any way. And I don't put that on you. And I, I, with Michael too, I agree with every social aspect that you're trying to bring forward. My only things is uh, rather than debating the rightness epistemolo epistemologically of what you're doing, I would just point you to a classic, what everyone would say is a settled argument. What you're making is William Clifford's ethics of debate or ethics of belief that was won over soundly in epistemology over 100 years ago with William James. There's no one that agrees with Clifford. Clifford would be the one who would actually support the idea of doxastic involuntarism. You cannot choose what to believe, except for the case where there's benefit of the doubt. And at that point, the ethics of belief is to believe something on faith because it benefits. We act on, our, on what we believe, and you have an ethical obligation to benefit someone the doubt, uh, someone the benefit of the doubt without enjoying any evidence or contrary to evidence that you have, because it's the ethical thing to do. So not all goals of truth telling are about propositions. It's how to act within the world. And for me, that's what Christianity is. It's not a proposition. It's how to act and perceive in the world. 
so without faith and without evidence on that, there would be it would be impossible for anybody to extend to anyone else the benefit of the doubt. Yes. Wrong. Well, there's a, there's some interesting books on this. If anybody's really curious about the relationships of um, of gods and morality, the the one is called Big Gods. It's um, uh, Ara Norenzion, How Religion Transform Cooperation and Conflict. It's an amazing book, along with God is Watching You by Dominic Johnson, how the fear of God makes us human. And he, he it's a, again, he connects this violent God with the rise of human morality. And as we all know right now, we all we have to do is look out across the American landscape at who decided to, to, to get out and vote our current um, administration, and these are people that Aaron Ra, Aaron Ra is rightly tackling because they have a violent God that is sacrificing not just people's minds, the sacrificium, sacrificium intellectus, but these people, these evangelicals and fundamentalists are sacrificing so many others, immigrants, women, uh, LGBTQ community. I mean, and so there is a battle. There's a righteous battle going on here. I just don't know that those of us that are not in that camp should be included as the enemy other, so to speak, or the, the irrational well, ones. I, I never That's made all. you an enemy, but, uh, and, I, and I'm sorry that I have to, I'm going to have to bow out. I have to go somewhere. Uh, and I Before you go, though, Art, let me say this. I really appreciate your, your willingness to come on here and talk to people who, you know, it's possible we just don't get it yet, right? And, and, and that's a possibility. Uh, but for you to come on here with, with several people who um, don't quite see it your way and to, and to talk, I, I really commend you for that because, um, you know, as we've gotten to know you o over the, the years, we just like you. We really do. And, we and, actually and, love uh, Arn Raw. I mean, come on, Bob. We know we, oh, yeah. we really appreciated it. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, it, it, some of the ideas that you present strike me as being extremely reasonable, and, and, and I, I'm resonating there with you a lot. Some of them, not so much. And hey, you know, that's true with everyone. Uh, you should hear Dr. Jones and I sometimes talk on the phone. I'm, I'm yelling at him. He's, 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 he's explaining to me stuff. I'm not buying it. And, 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 you know, I'm sure that if Michael Harden and I were to ha sit down for a coffee uh, and if we had two hours, we'd probably have a couple of five minute arguments, you know? It's oh, yeah. oh, yeah. That's the best kind of, that's the best kind of uh, theological work is this kind of wrestling oh, yeah. with ideas oh. and with each other, knowing that, knowing that the conversation, the relationship will, will remain. It's oh, just yeah. the ideas that are being worked. Okay. Yeah, so I just I just yep. want to make sure we couch this in in a context of the fact that uh, that uh, yeah that yeah we're having trouble kind of buying into this idea and I'm glad that you're able to talk about it uh, and, and uh, I think it needs to be talked about and uh, you know maybe we can't settle that issue between ourselves but you know what there'll be people who listen to this program some of them listening to R and going you know those other people they just don't make any sense I really like this R. <laughs> Well, you thank know, you very much, and I, I apologize. I do, I do have to go, like, right okay. now. Okay, so. thank you so much for being thank, here. Thank, thanks really. for being on the show. Uh, Take Good care. Night. Good night. Hey, there was something I was hoping to say before Aaron left, but I'd like to just throw this in out there. Uh, something I was thinking about, you know, we're all sitting here. One thing that we're all doing that we have in common, and that is breathing. All Black, right. Breathing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> breathe in and out. We can't help it. We can't stop. If we do, we'll have serious consequences. We know that. So we keep doing it. There was a time when human beings probably weren't even aware they were doing it, much less knew what was going on. But over time, through research into the unknown, into what we possibly thought was unknowable, now we know what's going on. And we can define it. We, we know what's happening and what all's involved, at least to a major degree. So, uh, you know, we can do it with uh, with good conscience and uh, knowing, hey, I'm gonna keep doing this from now on as long as uh, I'm allowed to, <laughs> as long as everything's still working. Yeah. You know, one of the and, things and, uh, that I was uh, hoping to get into tonight, I wanted to get into the various models of faith simply to say it, everything is not resting upon the same axis. Um, when we looked at, if we were to take some time and look at 
what's called an affective model of faith. That's much different than the cognitive, much different than the evaluative, uh, much different than what we call the, the practical side of it. And so, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, how, let's say, a particular model uh, relates faith as, as a state to an active component or two, uh, you know, that's much different than uh, a, a different model. And, and so this is why I started out, and I, I thought that it was clear, maybe not. Uh, I think John Bishop makes an incredible clear remark. Faith is a broad term appearing in locutions that express a different range of different concepts. I think that is, that is a wonderful way of putting it simply because it's all over the place. Point being, if we look at the purely affective model, we see this kind of faith happening while watching a movie. Um, we get emotional. Hello, do we not? And we don't mind pretending, and we put a lot into this and that. And, and so it's, it's not like the studies concerning faith um, in this context. Um, it's not like these things do not come and go. Uh, I would say that this is an iterative thing with some of these models. Uh, it's not so linear as some people suggest. And I, I think that there is a lot to this uh, doxastic venturing and even into the sub-doxastic uh, and the non-doxastic uh, venturing models. I think there is a lot that needs to be stated here because you can have actually um, a practical commitment that is to X, Y, or Z without having a belief set. Um, and I think that needs to be explored and talked about. But my point was, you have theologians who are extremely skeptical, very, very disciplined, talking about um, belief in a very measured way, talking about faith in a very measured way. And so we have models which suggest that this is involuntary, some is voluntary, and possibly, Stephen, you would want to add something to what I'm suggesting. Yeah, the frustrating part for me is that uh, it's, it's not it's a question about uh, religion or God or anything else. I'm interested in talking about epistemism, which is actually, it's not a maxim. It's not necessarily anything other than a strategy that tries to prevent error, errors in reasoning. And it's a very conservative one. As if now, it's done. <laughs> yeah, and we could, we could say, okay, well, you know, I might be a little bit more liberal in what my, instead of having a conservative model that tries to have zero errors in it, what I'm going to try and do is have a framework of thinking that allows me to think about more things is more error tolerant. So that would be a more liberal way to approach things. But again, that is it. That's a stance that I'm taking. And it's a stance that, uh, that uh, Aaron is taking. And it's not something that's absolute. And it's not even necessarily that either one of those stances are good ideas. They are strategies for trying to get at something that's true. It has nothing to do with religion. If I were to um, try to create some sort of an intercontinental ballistic missile defense system, I would need to have something that could detect um, incoming missiles. Now, and I'd also need to have something that could then respond to those incoming missiles. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of room for error in this system. For example, I, I, I need to make sure that that there's not like a flock of birds coming over and they're falsely detected as incoming missiles. I also need to make sure that there's not a missile coming in and it's uh, erroneously detected as a flock of birds. Well, you know, one way to make sure that I never miss a missile is just to determine <coughs> everything that detected the missile and, and respond. And one way to make sure that I never respond to, uh, to something that isn't a missile is to just never respond to anything anyway. Now, you see the problem here. W where do you fine tune this system so that you catch them all and you never make any mistakes. M my goodness, it, it, as it turns out, it's an extremely sophisticated system and it has to involve, in fact, our NORAD and, and things like this involves also the fact that once it's been detected, we have to send jets up to make kind of eye contact to, to you know, determine, oh, is this a false detection? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and it, fortunately, there are some things over which we can develop a wide variety of different methods and approaches so as to minimize error. But 
there are some things in life, I'm sorry, there just isn't time or ways to minimize the error. It, if people happen to believe in God and people don't happen to believe in God, how are we ever going to correct those kinds of errors? I, I, I have no idea how we even go about that. As long as we can recognize the nonsense that we say about these things, this nonsense we say, that doesn't really even say anything about the reality of the God we think is there or the God we don't have any sense as being there. So um, to me, I, I think that we're in some sense, trying to display our feathers and we're trying to show how, you know what, I'm, I'm a person of faith and it's because I'm so smart. No, I'm, I'm a person of faith. Why? I haven't got a real clue, but I do know that I am. And I do have some ideas that I entertain that try to explain this or that try to um, cope with it. But I've just find myself very comfortable being that person and and not only not only just being a person of faith but feeling as though my existence is loved and made precious is is something that i find affects me in a very positive nurturative way now what if it's what if it's all just crazy imagination <laughs> i don't care it affects me in a very positive nurturative way and and i'll take those benefits you know, just as they are, but but it's not as just because I want to be blind about it. Uh, I think that what Steve Partner said, this is totally involuntary. I don't think you know as much as I've studied psychology and human development and cognitive operations and the computational theory of mind, and I and I've listened to all kinds of philosophers and cognitive scientists, from Steven Pinker to Mr. Johnson to all these. You know, I. Uh, all I hear are theories that possibly explain it, and I don't have anything that I can really nail to the wall and say, well, that's it, no? So it's, it's, it's a tough thing. But, um, you know, I, I wonder if we're now, um, we might not want to go on too long since Aaron couldn't stay here, but I'll tell you, I'm really glad that we had this, this conversation. I wish that we could have had uh, um, Michael here a little bit more uh, so we could see you and, and where you're able to participate. Well, yeah, I think he set it up because he didn't want people looking at, you know, his peace sign in the back. I mean, you know, he's a hipster, no, you see. I, no, 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 no. It's, uh, I'm not sure. Well, I will have to sort this before next week, though, that's for sure. Okay, for those of you guys who don't know, Ozzy, yes, Ozzy's going to be on this show Wednesday night as a follow-up to this program. This, I, I mean, this chat isn't over. And also, Michael Harden will be back next Sunday night. And yes, he will have video and the peace sign in the back. I mean, it's going to be marvelous, wonderful. We're going to have a good time. Uh, so this is this is where we're going. Uh, typically, discussions are never, <laughs> they never come to an end mark. That is, they don't go full circle. And so I th I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, and I've been told when I read poetry, I can actually put people to sleep. Maybe that's my ministry. If you're having a tough time tonight sleeping, just listen to me teach or read poetry. Yes, and you can have a good night's sleep. But with that said, I would like, you know, some wonderful statements here uh, at the end of the show because I think we're making some progress. I mean, Aaron Ra is an amazing good guy. I mean, he is... I so appreciate him coming on the show, and he's willing to work in any context. From what I understand, I'm supposed to be on his show sometime this week or next week. It's going to be fun. But he understands that we need to respect one another, and that's the same thing that the rest of, the, of us here at NCG understand. This is why Michael Harden, he doesn't mind getting into a, a, a bit of tension, but at the end of the program, it's all about how much he loves Arn Ra and Bob Graves and Stephen Hoyt and Daryl and even me. Yes, me. And so if we say fuck or goddamn or anything like that, um, please understand that words have usage. Uh, and most of the time when we're saying shit or whatever, it's typically uh, almost like saying something wonderful. And so uh, don't judge us too critically. And so uh, hopefully you like the program tonight, and I'm going to go over to Daryl. Did you like this show tonight, or did you fall asleep, or what, Daryl? I liked it, but I just have one final comment, and it's mostly directed to Michael Hart. Okay, let me stop you real quick, because so many people are bragging about your beard when you got here. 
Uh, yeah. We're in the studio with a much better camera situation and everything. People were saying, man, oh, Daryl, he's looking good with that big beard. I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, well, they're, look, they're looking cool. forward to Christmas. And that just emphasizes peace, brother. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Uh, Stephen Hoyt, what are your final words to this show? Well, I think I know who I'm going to vote for for Senate. I do live in Texas, and I think I'm going to have to see if I can hunt him down. I think he lives over close to Dallas, I'm, you know, not far from there. But uh, I'd, I'd sure like to talk to him a little bit more, and uh, glad I had the opportunity to uh, be a part of this conversation at all. So thanks for having me. And hopefully you're going to be back on many, many more shows. I mean, you are a plus, yes, in the conversation. And Thank you. Uh, Please get to know Stephen. He's 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 wonderful. And uh, Michael Harden, what say you? I mean, you're this peace guy. I mean, preaching peace. I mean, come on. I mean, uh, typically we vote for those people who are hawkish. And I mean, you're all about this loving people, all about nonviolence and all of that. I mean, come on. What what's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong. Everything's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I think you uh, you can't do any better than to be a peacemaker. I don't think uh, I don't think human society is going to survive if, as a species, we don't make some pretty clear and solid decisions for peacemaking in our future. Um, not with the capacity we have to destroy the world in many different ways, many times over. So yeah, peace is important to me. It's very important. But a final word I would say is this, is that uh, like most conversations I have on Facebook with, with regular lay people, um, there's, there's just so much that's been written and published uh, that's out there in the academy, thousands of books, tens of thousands of journal articles. Um, that your average atheist doesn't even know about. I mean, you can't expect them there to, to know about. You, you really can't. They're fighting this very small provincial battle against, you know, certain ham-fisted fundamentalists. And, you know, I'm willing to get in there and scrap with them in that battle. But, but for them, for, for atheists in general, to look at um, theists as though we are somehow out of our minds... I just want to say, no, 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 we've, we've really got to rethink what the nature of science is. We've got to listen. We've got to pay attention to where the new discussions are, the new conversations, how technologies are affecting the ways we, we perceive things. I mean, all kinds of things that are not being done. I, I'm personally just weary of rehashing Locke, Berkeley, and Hume as to what constitutes evidence. My, I'm just saying, let's get out of the, in the 18th century, let's come into the 21st century, and let's work here. I, that's that's my bottom line. I love yeah. that. I love that. Oh, and boy, I tell you what, this is going to be good. Ozzy does have a backache. He may be standing the entire time. I don't know. And so uh, yeah. he he might build an igloo and broadcast out of his igloo. I mean, he's that kind that's, of guy. Well, that's going to be a that's going to be a trick. You know, if I had any final words, it would be. Um, I, I really appreciated the participation of everyone here tonight. And, and I would even resonate with something and want to really kind of highlight it uh, that, that Michael Harden was referencing to. Very few people have read Popper or Thomas Kuhn or various other people who discuss the philosophy of science. And as a result, it's a shame that there are some scientists who have as implicit a faith in science as some theists have in the Bible, and they don't realize that although there's a great benefit that has come away from science, it 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 you know it's not without its issues and its problems, and its history is not what they have been telling us it is. You know, and and so uh, to to read some of these things is not to throw science under the bus, but is to realize that. Um, it's an extremely useful tool, but it is not without its flaws, its biases, its politics, its money, its power and clout uh, that uh, that gets in the way. And and that is not to throw science under the bus. It's really, if anything, it's to say that uh, the, the the biggest problem that science has is the people doing it. <laughs> yeah, where's the problem? And 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 that's the same thing with the, with with the biggest problem there is in 
in God is is the people who think about him. You know, <laughs> so it's a real problem that we have here. But you know, we're trying to work it out. And I would agree that you know, peace is uh, is not just vital. Um, it is it is crucial. And we're at a we you know there are many people who debate whether or not we're at a point of no return. We could be. I hope not. Uh, and uh, so I, I hope that we really learn to to love each other, to value each other, to become people who can even in the differences that we have not seek to resolve all those differences, but learn to accept those differences while we are yet remaining free to think as we do because we do and maybe even because we don't even know why we do. Uh, but we can learn to respect and, and love each other and honor the dignity of life that we each um, possess. So anyway, I, I really appreciated all of our participants uh, and, and, and the things that were, were going on. Tough, tough, tough dis discussion. Obviously, we're not on the same page with this, but you know, we are friends. So Oh, yeah. May that be a may that be a model of how people who don't agree on some things can still get along. We're not about ready to get in a fist fight. Not, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, in fact, I, in fact, if I were to see Aaron uh, in the flesh, I'd probably the, my my first instinct would be give the guy a hug. So good to see him, you know, face to face. So now Aaron Raw is a big guy. I mean, the first time that I met him face to face, he's he, he's huge. <laughs> I went wow. What did you swallow? Uh, but uh, he's he's a teddy bear, and, and so many people don't know that. I mean, he and his wife, I mean, they are compassionist, and I can't brag enough about him. And this is one of the things that I want to have on a regular basis, good people coming together, having good conversations. And this means that we're not going to feed the trolls. We're not going to give them any kind of rhetoric to talk about and this is why i'm so thankful to have the kind of uh, viewers that we have i'm just hoping that uh, we can set up something in a few days to where we can have our viewers actually just picking up a phone or whatever calling in that would be a lot of fun if you guys could contribute to the show simply because i think that some of you guys are so much better at putting things together than we are when it comes to substance and so thank you guys for watching this show Let's do it again Wednesday night, yes, with Ozzy. Ozzy is in pain right now. He's thinking about polar bears and igloos and possibly fishing or something like that. But he's a guy that likes to live out in the wild or camp out in the wild, but yet he likes to talk on shows and make them great again. Good night.